Hello and welcome. And there's been a question out there already for asking who was at DGI Key last week. So much fun getting to meet so many people in person that I've seen online for so long. I love it. It's great. So much fun. Uh, and thank you all. And I got some feedback at the conference that I speak way too fast in these intros. So I'm going to slow it down a little bit. Let me know how it's going. Make sure you can understand everything that I'm saying. So here you go. Um, hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Data Diversity webinar, Key Elements of a Successful Data Governance Program, sponsored today by Precisely. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights via LinkedIn or other social platforms using hashtag data ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to open and access either the Q&A or the chat panels, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send you just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a recording of this session as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Matt for a brief word from our sponsor, Precisely. Matt, hello and welcome. Thank you. Share my screen real quick. Looks good. So, welcome. Uh, this is a very good uh, opportunity for us to talk to a whole bunch of people about, you know, what data governance is and what data governance isn't and why we do it. Um, and one of the points we would like to make is data governance for data governance sake doesn't really work. What we're really after is changing business outcomes. And when we talk about that, you know, there's four components we believe from a precisely perspective are critical to a good data governance program. And we'll start with the top right, business accountability. Business not taking ownership of the data is the critical en enabler. It's like, don't pass go, don't collect $200. We're at a standstill if we can't get the business to take accountability for the data that they require to run operations, analytics, finance, compliance. Then going down around the circle to ensure that every data component is being treated the same or treated correctly, you need a decision tree. What data, what does this data drive? What outcome is it supposed to support? We'll make our governance decision based on that. Going around the circle, do we have an architecture and a landscape, application landscape that supports what we're trying to do from a governance perspective and from a business perspective? Most importantly, are we getting the right data to the right system at the right time that is fit for purpose? If not, we have some issues to deal with. And then how do we measure? How do we measure? Are we moving the needle from a data quality perspective and a data reliability perspective and an integrity perspective to ensure that the business outcomes we said we're going to drive, we're actually hitting the mark? One of the other things we want to get into and make sure that everybody's understanding of this is governance is not a one-size-fits-all endeavor. Not everything that's in your landscape has to be governed to the same level of rigor that other things. If you think about it, you have the top of the funnel. This is all the data we have available to us. Of that, you probably use anywhere between, they, the number says 40. I've seen it go as high as maybe 60%. And that's really a, an, almost an outlier. Of that 40 or 60% you have, you may govern 10% of it, which means you've made a conscious governance decision on that element. Of that 10%, and this is with unerringly consistent accuracy, 
most groups identify between 100 and 200 data elements that are critical to how your business operates, whether it's reporting, compliance, analytics, or operations. That is it. And those are the elements you want to make sure you are making a very conscious governance decision on and how you're going to operationalize that governance to ensure that those business outcomes are being met. Now, who are we? We believe in data integrity. Our software, data enrichment, products, and the group I run, Strategic Services, deliver accuracy, consistency, and context to empower confident decision-making. Every journey to data integrity is unique and driven by business initiatives. Market trends, as most of you know, are accelerating really quickly. And the need for integrity of your data is getting more and more paramount. Our company with our software components and our services groups help you get there. What my individual group delivers is four things. What your data strategy should be. How your organization, and I know Peter's going to get into this, how your organization needs to look. Because once again, I said earlier, it's not a one-size-fits-all endeavor. And if anybody's telling you that, run quickly. How are you going, how are you operationalizing your data? And then most importantly, and this is mainly for all your C-level people, how are you showing the value you guys are delivering to the business. With that, Shannon, back to you. Thank you so much. And thanks to Precisely for sponsoring today's webinar and helping to make these webinars happen. And if you have any questions for Matt, he will likewise be joining us for the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A panel. So now let me introduce to you our speaker for the webinar series, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an acknowledged data management authority and associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, president of DAMA International and associate director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. For more than 35 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in 30 countries, including some of the world's most important. Among his 12 books are many first, starting before Google, before data was big, and before data science, Peter has founded several organizations that have helped more than 200 organizations leverage data, specific savings, which have been measured at more than 1.5 billion US dollars. His latest is anything awesome. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. And welcome and hello, everybody. It's uh, great to be here with you, Matt. Thanks for a great little wind up on this because I think you're right. We're entirely complimentary in our perspectives on this. I look forward to welcoming you back here in about uh, uh, 42 minutes, uh, sorry, 52 minutes, I can count mine. Anyway, the, the key here, this is one of those talks that if we were dishonest, we would say it's the secret sauce that goes into data governance programs. But what we're really gonna talk about here is how to identify that subset of the data that does in fact need governing. And that of course was critical to Matt's funnel concept that he described to you. What we're going to talk about today then is, uh, first of all, the data has some confounding characteristics that if you fail to take into account will cause you nothing but grief in the future. In addition to that, then there are four key items, keeping your data governance practically focused on strategy, making sure that your data governance program has the required commitment uh, that was just talked about again a second ago. It's got to exist at the programmatic level uh, in this. And then to just simply add ingredients gradually. Don't dump the entire spice in there all at once, but try a little bit and see what works and then add a little bit more as you go forward. And finally, of course, learn how to do this with storytelling because the more your team knows how to tell stories about what it's attempting to do, the easier it will be for everybody in the organization to figure out 
what is going on and I can get behind you because I can see tangible results in action. Let's just jump right in. Confounding characteristics, I type these words, key elements of a successful data governance program into uh, one of those AI generators and it came back with this. So clearly it doesn't know, uh, perhaps even scarier, this was another one that was suggested or even this one. So uh, nobody seems to know what these key elements of a successful governance program might consist of. And I think part of the reason for that is because data has been approached from a number of different perspectives correctly over the years. Again, just like the blind people coming upon the elephant for the first time from different perspectives, people have entered data from this. And this is more of a problem than most of us will admit, because it means that people think that data is this and only this, and doesn't include the other five things that are in the picture or whatever the number is that we uh, finally agree on for these things. There's always been confusion about data responsibility. IT thinks that data is a business problem, they can connect to the server, my job is done, whereas business thinks that IT is managing the data adequately. After all, title is a CIO, Chief Information Officer, what else would that individual be doing? Turns out the answer is a lot of things, and in fact, so many things, the data has fallen into an enormous gap between business and IT, and it's up to us to repair that gap as a team and uh, cooperate between us because the lack of understanding about data leads to people saying, well, I don't understand what the problem is if we have a flawed data foundation for our project. And I immediately talk about the princess on the P. Thank you, Hans Christian Anderson. The P is, of course, down here at the bottom of these mattresses. And uh, the princess is up at the top here, sleepless because of the P. And similarly, a data flaw will be in there for locking in the imperfections for the life of the application and it restricting future data benefits, decreasing the ability of the organization to leverage uh, around us. It accounts for 20 to 40% of IT budgets spent uh, migrating, converting, improving data all the way around here. And just simply lack of data governance causes everything else to take longer, cost more, deliver less, and present greater risks. Uh, thank you, Tom DeMarco, for those wonderful words. Again, going back to the concept of the funnel that was presented just a minute ago, uh, separating the wheat from the chaff is a critical component of data governance here. And the first thing that you have to convince people is that well-organized data is inherently worth more than less organized data. If you have trouble with that one, there's a wonderful uh, person named Abby Covert who's done a great job of saying that before the information age occurred, we still organized books in this fashion. And Abby has a wonder, wonderful series of YouTube videos, and more importantly, a book here called How to Make Sense of Any Mess. And of course, if you took the spine off of Abby's book, took the page numbers off of it, and handed it about the yard, it wouldn't show us much of anything. And this allows us to understand that 80% of our data is redundant, obsolete, or trivial, meaning that we should only concentrate our efforts on the focus on the very narrow 20% uh, that's there, or perhaps even less in some organized uh, organizations on this. And who's better qualified to make these decisions, of course, than the specialists who have been working with them in this area. If we don't have specialists in it, it means we have people that are completely confused and the, the data just becomes ephemeral as a result of that, adding up to a concept we call data debt. And data debt is the idea of getting back to zero so that we have a, an absolute starting place uh, where there is no data debts, uh, the machines are are well uh, honed and, and ready to go. But likely you're going to need skills in order to undo the data debt about this. Just to give you an example of how uh, pervasive it is, back in 2020, American Airlines and United Airlines were valued in an article in Forbes magazine that I've given you the reference there at the bottom of $6 billion and $9 billion respectively, but the data was valued tens of billions of dollars higher to this. This is something that you better believe that those CEOs would like to unlock the value of that data there because most of them get paid based on uh, worthwhile of the corporation if they could have unlocked double the value in United and, and maybe triple or even more the value in the uh, case of American here. Uh, this is what data debt adds up to and why people are having trouble uh, with this. So you've decided or been told to do data strategy, excuse me, data governance uh, around this, and you've got to get started. One of the first things to realize is that uh, it's not an old profession, uh, and it does require these bespoke solutions that are described. Uh, in other words, it's got to fit your organization. So 
unlike the accounting profession, which has been around and selling alcoholic beverages to each other for 8,000 years, we've only been at this a couple hundred years or so, uh, still gleaning value from insights such as, oh my goodness, if I uh, look at this weaving loom, I realize I could do mathematics with this weaving loom. And while that's a wonderful concept and, and thing to think about, it really leaves us in a terrible situation when we look at results. Uh, we've been asking for years, are we driving innovation, competing on analytics, managing data as a business asset, creating data different organizations, forging data cultures? The answer, as you can see here, overwhelmingly is no, 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 no. Uh, and the most important question on this particular survey, which we're grateful to Randy Dean for recording for us, is the idea that which is more problematic in your environment? So I'm focusing in here on the bar graph. Uh, that is uh, vertical in this case, instead of horizontal. And you can see the number 2018, and then yet year was 19% uh, to 80%. 2019, it was 10%, uh, 5%. I mean, the numbers don't change. These are largely problems that are people and process based. And the question you have to ask yourself is, whom else in the organization is in fact going to address these problems if we don't start on it right away with us uh, focusing on it? So let's look at governance for perspective. Governance is pretty straightforward. Most organizations do it. It's uh, all about the bottom line. In most cases, sometimes you're seeing some societal implications get into it, but all, all governance generally is, exists at the corporate level. Similarly, when we look down at IT, IT said well, we better make sure we're aligned with that and provide something that we can provide measurable value on. And I notice none of them have anything to do with data uh, on this. And here's some data governance definitions. And I, I'm so sorry, but my friends and colleagues who put these together did a great job of them, but I don't like any of them. And I can't imagine getting on an elevator and trying to explain it to a manager. Uh, here. I like to use the term managing data with guidance. And the idea is, would you want your soul non-depletable, non-degradable, durable strategic asset managed without guidance? The answer to that, of course, is typically no. And consequently, people start to move forward. As I'm moving up the food chain in organizations, the definition changes just slightly by adding the word decisions. So managing data decisions with guidance uh, around this, because most managers are making data decisions. They just don't know that they're making it. In fact, organizations make lots and lots of bad dis data decisions uh, on this. And this is, of course, because business makers are not knowledgeable about data as technical decision makers are not data knowledgeable. And this leads to bad data decisions. These bad data decisions result in poor treatment of organizational assets and poor quality data. This then leads onward to bad organizational outcomes, and the cycle is one of these lather, rinse, and repeat cycles. This is wrong. My sample of Morgan Freeman there. Thank you, Morgan Freeman. Yes, that absolutely it is wrong. Let me just give you the most recent and egregious example that I've seen over and over again in the past couple of years, which is that organizations are moving to Salesforce by an IT-driven deadline as opposed to a data quality-driven deadline. And this has hurt Salesforce immeasurably over the years because Salesforce customers are very much not able to distinguish between Salesforce good software filled with bad data and uh, Salesforce not functioning correctly. So Salesforce gets a bad reputation because it's rushed into production without data quality applied to the process. And consequently, organizations make bad data decisions about it and have bad experiences with good quality software. In fact, moving to any quality software from a data perspective, there's sort of three questions that we should address. Is the quality of the data in the new system forecast to be of better quality in the data than the old system? And if it's not, Certainly lifting and shifting is not going to improve data quality, and that, that's a motivational question as to why would somebody do that. Number two, are we able to or formulate plans to obtain significant new value? In other words, if we put this transformation and put the data in this new system, are we going to be able to obtain new value? If, if we can't plan anything at all, we don't have specifics enough around that. Finally, does this give us an opportunity to consolidate data and other data types. It's not enough that the software meets the requirements. It's that the software must meet the data governance requirements that are occurring within the organization. And as, uh, again, was stating at the top of the hour, should we govern all this data? Many organizations look at this and say, well, we'll start with the A's and we'll get to the Z's, right? Uh, it's just not going to work. Instead, the question should be, is this governance, excuse me, this data that I'm looking at right now, 
should we include this within the scope of our current data governance practices? And that way you're adding a value component to it and saying, is this item valuable enough? Is it non-rot uh, if we go back to that? And it doesn't matter what the answer is, document the decision why so that organizations can really follow this and get the benefit of understanding the reasoning that occurred at that particular in time. Because after all, something may have changed such as organizational strategy. Let's dive in. What is strategy? Uh, most the references to the word strategy occurred before the year 1950, which was the year that management consultants discovered the word strategy and came up with these grand plans. And while PowerPoint hadn't been invented in 1950, you can still bet there were 100 uh, page strategies on there. And that made strategy in the modern era more of a thing, a noun uh, on here. Of, yes, what is the strategy? But I like to go back to the original definition, which was derived from the military use of this. And their definition is a pattern in a stream of decisions. And that, instead of being a thing, is a process. Let me give you three quick examples here. Here is Walmart's former business strategy. I'm not telling you anything you didn't already know because they did a brilliant job of making sure everybody in the world understood that Walmart's business strategy depended on every day low price being in the minds of their consumers, their suppliers, their neighbors, their customers, you name it. People understood this. Again, marvelous job in terms of that. Wayne Gretzky, uh, the great soccer player, uh, again, has, uh, sorry, ice hockey, what did I say, soccer, uh, had a great strategy. He skated to where he thinks the puck will be. Uh, if you're chasing the puck and the puck is faster than you on ice, you will never catch up. A lot more at his uh, Wikipedia entry on this topic. It's a very interesting example. Here's number three, where the good guys on the left and the bad guys are on the right. <laughs> We're going to employ one strategy if we're here. We're going to employ a different strategy here. If we're up at the top of the hill and the bad guys are down at the bottom, then we will if the bad guys are at the top of the hill and we're at the bottom. So pattern in a stream of decisions should make sense now. And none of the 100-page uh, PowerPoint decks or anything else are important relative to that piece. One thing also to note here about the importance of strategy, strategy guides work group activities. I know I read the words there and that may not mean anything, but if you think about it, when a work group's looking around to each other as to what to do, they go by what they believe collectively strategy is. And so it's one of the most important leverage points that you have in organizations from a governance perspective. Let me show you a relatively straightforward data governance a proposal here. This is something that's prepared to advise the top executive in the organization what you're doing uh, around these disparate pieces. It's a, a government example, so it certainly will have those aspects of it. But I, I hope the message that you're taking from this is that this is complex. And to try and start with something this complex, it's got to show substantive value in order to be able to sustain itself in the long run, or it will succumb to all cost-cutting measures as they inevitably do. Let's take a look on what a data strategy is then. A data strategy is the highest level of guidance that's available, focuses on specific articulated business goals, and provides guidance when faced with a series of decisions or I'm going to have again, provides guidance when faced with a stream of decisions or uncertainties. They most usefully articulate how data can support the strategy, how it can better support the strategy. And there's a balance of these remediation and proactive activities, as we've described as well. The organizational strategy is, of course, going to guide the data strategy, and the data strategy exists to support the organizational strategy, both in terms of ideas of data as well as actual data that is provided up there. The data strategy coordinates with the data governance group to say what the data assets do to better support the strategy. The governance group is closer, so they will do a better job of implementing that and reporting back in how ill is the data strategy working on this particular approach. Their main lever that they have from a data governance perspective are the data stewards, and what's the most effective way of employing those limited available resources who reply with plans progress, problems, et cetera, et cetera. We always want the data strategy to be expressed in concrete, measurable business goals, and that the language of data governance should be the language of metadata. And the more we repeat that process with the data stewards, the better communication we will have all the way around. 
add to that finally a trusted catalog or starting to use controlled vocabularies in here and now we're really starting to make some progress let's observe how this role occurs over time again trusted catalog may start out with a couple of entries literally but then grow over time and, and the typical process is there's some new leadership that occurs in there and that they start working on data governance activities and finally somebody realizes that the amount of time it's going to take to improve the water quality falling over Niagara Falls depends on how much effort we can put into changing the upstream flows of water. Many people perceive that often as slow. And so they go, we've got to do something that is faster than that. And they start things, at least the U.S. Army calls them data improvement projects, which they uh, analogize by putting wheels on the sleigh there, uh, snail sleigh. Uh, data improves as a result of very specific focus in these, so sort of a, a proactive thing we were talking about before. And as you're getting your infrastructure in place with the stewards, the community participants, et cetera, in here, we can start to achieve some tangible result in there. One of the things we've been good about, but not great, is saying when something happens in the data world, there's a correlation to that in the organizational world. We've been too good about celebrating things happening data-wise, but not celebrating them enough as we've moved into the organizational side of things where we'd really like things to happen. All, of course, during this time, we've been building up in the trusted catalog uh, in order to do this. There are basically four functions that were previously done part-time off the side of somebody's desk that can be incorporated in data function. And that involves these four quadrants here, which are really support for organizational strategy. Better IT outcomes helps from a, a planning perspective. The operational part is, is being handled fine, but the planning parts are the parts that have been challenged. Uh, better managed high quality data assets. And finally, a focus on the ability to improve the productivity of our knowledge workers in there. As I mentioned, these have been typically handled by a group that's kind of gotten confused in mixed settings and it's been not working out so well, so we're going to try and concentrate that down into one individual. And that one individual will be enabled with the ability to track things down and do system analysis because almost all of the data challenges that are encountered organizationally are filtered through some combination of an IT system or a business practice. And that one individual will be able to connect the dots, understanding the commonalities of those core results resolve to a single data element in many cases. Root cause analysis is absolutely part of data governance. And more importantly, if somebody offers you 10 people 10% of the time, turn around and trade it in for one full time because only by specializing in these skills and developing this ability to create this repeatable process and to sustain organizational skill sets will the organization be able to attack their challenges in a manner that's both proactive as well as reactive, uh, depending on what they find in all of this. Keep in mind that data governance best thought of in an analogy that's very much like a firehouse. Uh, those of you that are familiar with them understand that the, there's times when you're responding to fires and you grab your coats and jump in the trucks and go fight a fire and save lives uh, around that. You never know quite what you're going to happen to run into. And I, I love that analogy for our data governance professionals because we never know. Harmless. exactly what we're going to run into very much like macgyver there uh diving into things and certainly there's an amount of time where you have some downtime at the fire station uh, but there's also time where you're going around and doing data education and uh, fire prevention and changing uh batteries out of uh uh, smoke detectors and all sorts of other things in here. So sum up this section again, the, the governance is important because it costs millions in productivity and, and siloed efforts not being eliminated, poorly thought out hardware and software investments and badly in things, uh, things into the cloud. You're seeing a lot of pushback on that at this point. Delayed decision making uh, uh, around all this. I've already mentioned the 20, 40 percent of IT governance. Data governance must exist at a programmatic level uh, in order to do this. And the key, first of all, is to understand that data is not a project. IT has gotten extraordinarily good at the process of creating new capabilities through functions. We have some proven methods that are working better than we've been able to in the past. And that's a wonderful thing. But as you can see from the top of this, data is not 
a project, it evolves and it changes. One of the nice things about being as old as I am is I get to go back and visit people I worked with literally 40 years ago at this point. And I can tell you that the vast majority of them are working with the exact same data and data structures that they were working with when they started. So what needs to happen is not something anything new I've called for, but many have called for. That is to separate, exter make external to and precede system development lifecycle activities where the data programs are driving the IT programs, because if we don't have that, we'll be in a constant state of attempting to patch our systems to work with our data, and it just doesn't work that way. It wasn't ever designed to work that way, and it, we can never expect it to come up with a good result in that same fashion. I'm spelling programs the British way, the European way, because I do want to distinguish between data programs, right, uh, and, and, and software programs uh, in that concept in here. So what's the difference between data governance and data management? Well, first of all, governance is going to be at the policy level, setting general directions or guidelines. Uh, for example, you might never have had a policy prior to this that says all information not marked public should be considered confidential. That may have a tremendous impact on your organization, the way it's going on. And keep in mind this firehouse metaphor, the idea that there's a variety of different things that need to happen, and each one is likely uh, going to be unique in terms of the encounters uh, that go into it. So what is data management? Then what's the business function? Planning for controlling and delivering the information assets that are uh, required in this case, and delivering data to solve the business challenges uh, around this. And quite frankly, if we hadn't uh, messed up sort of the angle we had gotten into in this. It wouldn't require so much remediation, but we've let so much data debt accumulate now that it really does need to be factored in as part of the understanding. That said, most on the outside have no real interest in what we're talking about here on this uh, webinar. And I, I thank you for your attention on this, but this is what happens on the outside. We've got lots of things that are going on in the data world and there's some data management now we're trying to talk a little bit more detailed about data governance but that's what everybody else hears so just call it one thing it's part of our data program because our data program is what we need you to focus on and we haven't been doing a data program to the right perspective the right drummer the right way if you want to uh, in order to do that one of the main differences is that we've treated data as a project because data has been thought in the past to be part of it it is not part of it because it doesn't concentrate on the value of the data it concentrates on on uh delivery and piping and infrastructure and, and aspects so data really is a program and what I want you to ask your organizational representatives that are having trouble understanding this concept are a couple of questions. One, do you think there are going to be more data interactions between your, your organization in the future or less? The answer, of course, is going to be more. And then do you think that uh, there's going to be ever a time when we're not going to need the data? So your data program is going to last at least as long as your HR program uh, in order to do this. And this is an important point to drive home in people's minds that, gosh, if I'm going to have one of these things around for a while, I'd better have a good one and better do it right. Uh, so let's dive in and look at how to do from a governance perspective relative to something that's near and dear to my heart, the DIMBOC. Uh, for those of you that are meeting it for the first time, I'm going to go back upside there. Uh, the DIMBOC is a representation of possible practice areas that are inside of data management uh, created by data manage, excuse me, DEMA International back in 2009, I believe. Uh, we've got an updated version on it. And each of these represents in one or more practice areas that we have within there. So we might be trying to do something that you can see on the bottom left, I designated as a combination of governance, warehouse, and quality. And the reason I bring it out in the structures because most of these things don't work very well on their own. That it's really best to approach them as combinations of three, but not seven, uh, right? It's just a, a few number, but a, a couple supporting each other. We might, for example, in the first iteration of the problem, take one experience point by trying to do some data quality, some data warehousing, and some data governance uh, in there uh, in order to do that. And that leads us to a reformulation of the problem and a second pass at it, a second cycle, uh, which is, by the way, just making the same thing real that happens in all IT things anyway. We always work on the third version and, and later. 
second version of this, we've shifted from data quality to metadata uh, in this focus. Uh, and again, notice we are up to two X points in data governance and warehousing. And finally, uh, the third version of it, the one that finally finished the project correctly, we went to reference and master data. But we now have three X experience points and three X experience in warehousing in this. And we've gotten better at those activities and some experience in some other aspects of things. The idea of focusing in on a data governance, I like to use something that was uh, created a while ago called a lighthouse metaphor. And that is the idea that there are sort of three things that we can overlap and try and find the intersection of all of them is really the best. The first thing is things that help our organizational strategy, whatever we can do to improve data and improve the performance of the organizational strategy via data means absolutely great. That's a good universe of things to look at. It intersects with data that is used by the business and needs improving. So in addition to furthering strategy, if we can find something that also helps to improve the quality of some specific measurable, identifiable business data items, that's great as well. And we may need to practice data skills. Remember, I want you to have full-time staff doing this kind of work as opposed to 10% of 10 people uh, part-time in order to do this. And when you have the intersection of all of those three places, you have a really nice sweet spot that allows you to focus in and start to work on very, very tangible data practices that are able to be focused from a governed perspective and understood by the outside as helping in all of these different types of areas that you have in order to look at these. Uh, let's take a look at a, another thing that we're going to be facing no matter what, and that is the idea that we've done many of these things in IT in what we call an IT project or an application centric development perspective, which is the idea that we started out and said strategy, and then we should add some IT to it. And then after we add some IT data and information are kind of the tail wagging the dog at the other end of it, which leads to some challenges and problems in those areas. And there's a wonderful book by our colleague, Dave McComb on this, uh, that if you haven't had a chance to get into, it's a, a real good read uh, for this, but it really is the wrong way to think about organizational uh, and data strategy. And that's the idea that it derives through and filtered through an IT piece. Uh, again, Morgan. This is wrong. Thank you, sir. Yes, very much love suppling him in that capacity because he says it so well. Instead, the right way to do it, of course, is to have a parallel component for your data strategy and your IT strategy and your governance group is going to have to fight for if that doesn't exist already there. Similarly, you can see I'm indicating as well that the data strategy has an outdo influence on that oversaw process. So what I've done here is simply flip the idea that we originally started with data, excuse me, so we started with strategy and then went to IT projects and data and information. And we just have, just have to make that little change. Now, those of you that have been in the business for a while know that is not a simil, uh, simple change in order to do. It's a very fundamental change, but nevertheless, it is the way in which we need to think about things and governance needs to push for it and make sure that does happen. If it's not able to do that, it will have trouble always going forward uh, around that. Uh, third component is to add ingredients slowly but steadily in here. And I just want you to do a little bit of a digital insight with me, courtesy our, our friend of Mark Johnson. Uh, we're doodling on a Zoom call one day and he doodles and says, you know, I see that if I subtract data from digital, I'm not sure what I get. But I do see that if I subtract digital from data, I still have the data left over. And that's because while everybody wants to go digital now, nobody really has a clue as to what that actually means. And you cannot do it, of course, I'm talking to a group of data governance professionals here, without the idea that you're doing a lot more than just spelling data. Uh, in many cases, again, a wonderful cartoon, I wish I knew the origin of it because it's a, a very apt one, shows that in, in this case, some random person in Nebraska has a manual process that was which the entire house of cards or the digitization effort uh, you know, is, is dependent. It requires much more work if we're going to do that because we all understand the principle of garbage in, garbage out. And while we do understand that principle, there are many who do not and do not understand the same thing with the, the folks that are implementing Salesforce and deciding to optimize by a delivery date instead of to optimize when the quality can be of a certain level in there. And because it doesn't matter what you have in the middle, this garbage in, garbage out model is going to be true, whether the thing in the middle is a warehouse, whether it's machine learning algorithm, business intelligence, blockchain, AI, MDM, data governance, 
governance, analytics, technology, or literally all of them at once I've seen in some organizations. Now, the challenge, of course, around all this is that we have to go through and understand, because it's always going to be true, that you're going to have poor results in order to do this. So we start by harmonizing existing data flows. And so many organizations spend so much money sending so much stuff, the same stuff back and forth and back and forth. If there's money in them, uh, ETL flows that you can get out of, which sounds crazy. Now you unblock the good quality data, make it run all the way through. And let me focus in for just a minute here on machine learning. Because once again, governance is going to be the area, you're going to have some data scientists, perhaps in your organization, uh, or not now, but soon, if not now. And it's going to take them three years to learn your business and to learn what's important about that. You can help expand that trend really fast by instead of them trying to say, I have an algorithm, where's this data? You simply say to them, here's this data, design the algorithm in order to support this. And this will avoid several of the more embarrassing AI oopsies that we've had recently. Here's one example, a, a newly released chatbot, and people know I like chatbots, so they, hey, they come to me. So I, I ask it the question, this is me in the black there, so what are you? And the chatbot comes back and says, I am a chatbot. And I say, what is a chatbot? And it says a chatbot is a program or an artificial intelligence which conducts a conversation via auditory and textual methods. And I say, why would I want to chat with a chatbot? And it says, uh oh, it looks like I'm stumped. Please submit a ticket below and we'll get back to you at our earliest convenience. This is such a perfect metaphor for unfortunately how so many AI resources are prematurely deployed and can be better focused in the organization. Because the thing the organization is going to depend on is something I call the data sandwich. They're leveraging high performance automation in one degree or another. And that high performance automation depends on a combination of literacy, a combination of data supply, and a combination of data standards being applied within and across the organizational ecosystem, because all three of these things have to work together in order to get the organization to perform at the level that it has with the error rate that is acceptable. Uh, something perhaps avoiding Southwest Airlines uh, uh, debacle that they had across the uh, holiday season this year, just to toss in one of the uh, examples that many of us experienced uh, around that. So notice the, the, the statement that popped up on top of that one, those three pieces, those three architectural blocks, merged so seamlessly together. And it says that this cannot happen without investments in engineering and architecture. And I found that Deming quote on a cash register that this English, uh, excuse me, at this Indian tea farm that I was on uh, adventure seeing uh, out there. And it was just such a wonderful thing. I appreciated it, but appreciated finding it uh, at that particular junction, the better. And it, it should make sense that these quality engineering and architecture work, work products do not, and in fact, cannot happen accidentally. And if we insert the word data into those sentences, as we're in data governance here, we have to make sure that the governance folks know how to understand incorporate and push for, advocate these concepts as well. This next section we're going to talk about is a little bit about frameworks. And for those of you that haven't seen this picture before, that is literally the location I am speaking to you now. In fact, about the weather that is outside uh, at this point in time too. That, of course, is not worth looking at, but the thing you're seeing in the front there is a barn uh, foundation, uh, what's called a horse husband, for those of you that don't know. And you may be wondering, what on earth does it have to do with taking a picture of a barn foundation and data governance? Well, first of all, consider the circumstances of the photograph. I had taken out a bank loan for the uh, uh, barn construction in there. I'm not a constructor myself, uh, although my wife did design the the structure, and uh, the bank gave us exactly this much money to do. Before further construction must proceed, there was to be a foundation inspection by the county that they would submit to the bank, and then and only then would additional funding be produced. Well, that makes good business sense, does it not? Uh, knowing anything about horse husbands, uh, we know that the vet bills are going to come first, and if I built a poor quality barn on top of a good foundation, it would be okay. But if I build a uh, good quality barn on top of a poor foundation, I would have injured horses and I would be paying their bills. And then I would pay the bank secondarily. And that's not good business sense. But there is 
no IT equivalent for this, and we need to put it in place. And governance is one of those structures that fits into here. So these governance frameworks are really a way of guiding analyses, organizing project data, mainly think of it as trying on ways in which you might use these to govern. And you get some guidance from here. For example, don't put up the walls until the foundation inspection is passed because there is no point in it. Or once you do get the walls up, put the roof on as soon as possible so that we can have uh, inclement weather protection given a physical building structure. These are a number of these. Uh, you, they're on my website as well. You can certainly take a look there. But this is the one from DEMA, which is the uh, pro input process output thing. And I'm not going to go through, and there's a lot of words here. I'm certainly not going to read it. These are mainly for you all. Remember, you get the slides so that you can uh, download them and use them at your leisure. Here's Gwen Thomas's uh, Data Governance Institute. And Gwen is back on the market. It's good to have you back out, Gwen, uh, and, and see you at the uh, DGIQ, as Shannon mentioned, we were all there last week and had a wonderful time with a sold out event. Uh, Bob Seiner's uh, KIK Construction, again, sorry, const construction, consulting. Uh, sorry, Bob. Uh, a marvelous job in terms of this. Lots and lots of uh, areas. These are old diagrams that he's had. I'm sure he's upgraded since then. IBM had some offerings in this area. The point is, try these things. Here's one that I like that has a lot of robustness. Uh, Jill Deshay from SAS, uh, her group had put this one together in order to do this. Some people are very clever with these things. Don't uh, worry, we're not going to dive in too far, but the American College of Personnel Association decided theirs was a boat, right? Well, let's let's hold off and, and look at the way I look at it from a framework perspective and then try those to see how they look at yours uh, in order to come up with this. First of all, IT clearly has to play a role. We can't exist without them. They play the same foundational role that they've always played for everything that happens in our organization. As a consultant, of course, I use four quadrant consulting diagrams. And the left-hand side here, on the left-hand side of the orange line, the domain expertise of these individuals who are on that side is less, and the roles are more formally defined. On the right-hand side, the opposite is true. The domain expertise is greater, and the roles are less formally defined. I said it was a four quadrant, so we have the origin, or, excuse me, orange piece and the uh, brown piece. The brown one shows that the things on the bottom half encounter governed data more directly and that more time of theirs is dedicated to the topic of data governance, as opposed to the top half, which the encounter the data that's governed less directly and less time is dedicated to those individuals, okay? So everybody's got the four quadrants that are there. You can see I've already populated it in with the four components. We've got leadership, which are the data decision makers, the stewards, they're the data trustees, the others, uh, data makers and consumers, all of them are knowledge workers, so they all play a role. And we have some specific subject matter data experts that occur within the framework in here, and they are heavily utilized. Most organizations draw a yellow circle around the left-hand side of this diagram but I've seen other organizations do it other ways. Remember, there is not a wrong way. It's something that gets things done so that you can use data to apply more effectively to the process of the organization achieving its strategy. So left-hand side of this diagram is being designated the data governance group for this example only. There are other options. Leadership is responsible for acquiring resources, listening to feedback and understanding it, making decisions that then we hand to the stewards to make the uh, decisions they make an action plan and require changes and things that go into the others. Uh, in there, there's again, data feedback, ideas, stuff that comes into it, guidance, and gets us started in order to move. Uh, I don't notice I've taken the quadrant diagram off. This is the one I would use to show with people if you need to share them uh, in there. But again, you can get the idea of, of how that works. And more importantly, you can talk about how things would work. You can desk check it, program it, try it out, kick the tires. That's what frameworks are for. See what they work and, and, and what works for your organization, your style, your communication, your solutions to helping get data governance moving in a faster direction. When you get started with data governance, the thing I found 
is the hardest for organizations is simply the getting started part. It can seem like a daunting thing to have to put together all of this stuff and, and look at it. And the next couple of slides, once again, are reference material for you. They're not required uh, for you to, to absorb uh, on here. And I certainly don't intend to because I'm going to downplay the importance of them. So use them as checklists uh, from that perspective. So uh, once again, uh, goals and principles that you may have uh, in order to do this. What are the types of deliverables? See whether these work for you. What are the responsibilities? Here's a master list for you to take a subset from. A scorecard, uh, what are the things that are important? Yes, I've seen a lot of organizations uh, get graded on the number of decisions that they make, but uh, it's probably better to tie those decisions to business value. Uh, and that is a checklist for you that you can use to, to put together. And the reason I'm going so fast through all of these is because I look at them as a set of components that need to be addressed lightly. I don't mean that in a bad sense, uh, but it is important to understand that you're going to do these things exactly one time in order to get started. And yes, it's important to get a process going, but I would also suggest that your organization should be open to the idea that this is going to evolve over time. Uh, again, I tell organizations when they appoint their first round of data stewards, make sure that they advertise it as appointing the first round of data stewards, because so many people get left out of those first rounds. And if you appoint the first round, they will expect there to be a second round that will populate uh, along with that. So yes, these things are important, but spend some time. Uh, again, I, uh, I like to use the, the, the concept here that it's going to occur once. And if you've got a process to get better at something, get better at the thing that's on the right-hand side there, if you will, because executing the plan, evaluating results, revising it, and applying change management should sound awfully familiar. If it doesn't, it is the plan, do, check, act model from, again, the Deming quality cycles uh, that go through this. So I find that most methods, um, people like to call them fancy things like methodologies, accrue up to this sort of a plan, do, check, act uh, thing, and, and almost anything can work within there. So don't be paralyzed by the left-hand side of this diagram and saying, oh my goodness, how am I going to get through this? And, and all of these things must be perfect. No, instead they are going to evolve. And, and it helps when you have some guidance that you can get along the way in order to, to look at that, that would be great. But nevertheless, the part that's the important part is, what am I doing to achieve results? So while I have lots of organizations that have got data governance charters, I have many fewer organizations that have achieved sustainable business value from the process of getting better at governing their data than they can in order to create the most perfect uh, starting point that they possibly can come up with. So let's take this now to the last chunk of this, which is storytelling. It is critical that everybody in your organization be aware with and be quite frankly tired of and able to finish your sentences on your data governance stories. The reason it's important is because you want them to get to the point where they say, you're not going to tell me the chocolate story again, Peter, are you? And I say, uh, yes. In fact, I was just getting ready to do so. But since you recall it very well, why don't you tell it yourself? Or if everybody's got it, we just say, well, we've all got the chocolate story and let's move forward. It becomes a part of the organization's culture so that they understand this. And in the context of the chocolate story, absolutely, that is one that is understood. So here's a, a great one to start with. Uh, many organizations got heavily into the idea that digital also involves some aspect of cyber currency uh, in there or, or NFTs or something along the lines. And the, the story is quite fun. This was Jack Dorsey's first tweet in 2006 on March 30, uh, 21st. Uh, he tweeted just setting up my Twitter and abbreviated it in a format that somebody who me, like 64 years old, can't quite figure out what that word is, but I guess it's Twitter. Uh, anyway, so yeah, the Jack Dorsey's tweet, and it came, by the way, it was sold for $24 million uh, when it was originally uh, sold. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm sorry, no, no, it sold for $3 million, and the guy who said it was going to, who was going to buy it, Sina Estava, was going to sell it, and he thought it would get him $48 million, and instead it got him 20 
$280. Now that is an astounding amount of oopsie to be playing with in there. And while he was going to devote half to charity, he decided not to sell it uh, in that context. So many organizations are discovering that the volatility that's associated with the crypto markets is just an unacceptable risk uh, around there uh, from a business perspective. And this simply illustrates one aspect of it. If your organization has direct focus in there, use the direct focus. Here's another one. It was a wonderful healthcare company that worked with, and they kept telling us that, wow, our getting data from our organization is just like that Catherine Zeta-Jones movie. Uh, where she has to get through all of those lasers. And some of you may remember she and Sean Connery were involved in a robbery, blah, blah, blah. Wonderful film, but also wonderful evocative language. And when management found out about this and said, wow, why would we want to make it difficult for our knowledge workers to use data as part of their knowledge? Uh, again, very important use of this, very important aspect from a data governance perspective, quite useful to involve and show that there's a complete understanding and leveraging ability around the organizational culture to do that. Barclays Bank has a uh, well-determined uh, set of governance articles around their spreadsheet. Here's why. Uh, when they were buying Lehman Brothers, they were having their arm twisted into buying Lehman Brothers is what it was. They got down to a final contract and of this thousand plus uh, row spreadsheet, there were 179 that were uh, tried to eliminate. They said, we're not going to buy those no matter what you bring to us because they're so bad uh, in there. And they handed the spreadsheet to a first year associate who went home after midnight and reformatted the sheet and unfortunately unhid all the rows that were hidden, which were the 179 that they didn't want to buy. But the judge said, too bad, you get them all. Anyway, the sale is now closed. Uh, again, governance around spreadsheets, absolutely at Barclays. Uh, one last spreadsheet example on here, and that is uh, back to coronavirus. While we don't necessarily like to talk about it, it certainly seems like it was an avoidable self-inflicted wound to equip our health care professionals with a database technology that would literally drop uh, 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 rows of data and without any warning to the user that they were doing it because they were using a .xls file instead of a .xlsx file type. Uh, again, what a terrible thing. What something, unfortunately, the data governance is, in fact, going to get tarred with if they're not careful uh, from that perspective. One last component on this. This is a, an example of uh, take an engine manufacturer here. Uh, and they had, in general, the old days, one piece of uh, sensor on there, and it would sit into the fan, and it could come up with probabilistic formula maintenance forecasts say, you know, we need to maintain this engine every 16 takeoffs or 10,000 miles or whatever the number of, uh, you know, measurables that were involved in it. But now the idea that we could put sensors literally around the engine and they can continuously send back to the organization 9 million data points per minute. Uh, it is an astounding amount. They know so much about these engines that there's as you can imagine, a superb safety record uh, around about this. But more importantly, in addition to having a better safety record, the manufacturer was also able to reduce storage costs, handling opportunity, making a total savings of a billion and a half for this organization in order to do this data governance process with them for the year. So we're going to get to our overview and takeaways here as we do. Uh, again, data has some very confounding characteristics, which means you have a very uneven understanding. And if you're trying to explain it to people in an elevator, uh, you shouldn't be surprised that people have fractured views and uh, that they are unfamiliar with the increasing organizational data debt that occurs. But by keeping data governance practically focused on strategy, everyday low price is a really easy target when you're in there. It, it's recognition that this is a young profession and we're going to support the strategy by improving the data and its use in short term and long term. And that means we can't just improve the data for people. We also have to improve the way in which people use that data. Data governance must exist at the same level as HR. We need to develop specialist effectiveness uh, governance and, and, and uh, data management are both centralization to, excuse me, central to digitization 
efforts around that. And again, decoupled entirely from IT strategy. Finally, gradually add the ingredients with the idea that we're trying to enable this high-speed automation, employee frameworks to refine focus around that, but keep an idea in mind that this is a exercise of plan, do, check, act in that sense here, and learn to get better at storytelling. It's simply a good idea at your regular meetings to take a minute or two and practice telling each other data stories. There's no harm in it, and it's a, a really good exercise, and you'd be amazed at how many people discover something as a result of something that is actioned like that. So we've talked a fair amount here. I'll give you a minute to think about some takeaways and Q&A and say that the need for data governance is increasing because of the increase in volume and practice. Uh, improvement needs to get better as well. That it's a new discipline. It's got to conform to constraints. There is no one best way. And in fact, I think it was said at the top of the hour by Matt, uh, there is absolutely, if they tell you it's a cookie cutter thing, walk away. And I like that, uh, that concept there. Uh, it's got to be driven by these four elements that I've talked about, keeping focused on strategy, programmatic instead of project specific focus, gradually adding ingredients and learning the value of storytelling to improve our data governance initiatives over time. A favorite book of mine by my colleague, John Ladley, a couple of reference for you all. And we jump in back here to the Q&A part. Hey, Shannon, I went over today, didn't I? Oh, you know, your perfect timing as always, Peter. It's really so impressive that you time it so well. Um, if I'm you have robot. questions, <laughs> if you have questions for Peter, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion. And Matt, of and Matt. And Matt, yes, I have questions for Peter and Matt. So I um, submitted them in the Q&A portion of your screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session and our many reiterations of pictures there. <laughs> um, so diving in here, um, so Peter and Matt, so some global companies have their own data governance framework. If someone has a DM bot framework, how to proceed accordingly in the company without being a rebel? Well, I think that the questioner has answered the question themselves, and Matt, maybe you want to jump in here as well. But the the idea of trying to oppose, you know, any sort of thing that's for the organization is clearly a bad uh, career is over kind of maneuver in there. The DIMBOK is not prescriptive in its nature. The DIMBOK talks about what needs to be done, but it really doesn't talk about how uh, in that sense. Uh, Matt, again, I'll toss it to you on that. Is that a good good spot for you? No, I, I, I completely agree with you. I, the whole thing about the framework is, it to me, it really doesn't matter which one it is, as long as you have one and you use it consistently. There you go. As long, as long as you are being disciplined in that, you could have one that my kids did when they were five. I does that part doesn't really matter to me. Let's actually tease that a touch further back because it's it's a one hundred percent alignment with what I'm trying to get across here as well. Mm -hmm. um, some of you may be familiar with something called the trolley problem. And there's a whole meme on the internet about the trolley problem, including some of these two-year-old solving it and AI solving it as well. But the idea is yeah, you've got a chance of sacrificing one to save five. And just at a very highly simplistic level, if the organization says, always do that, then you're going to have people that have a predilection towards doing that. And that's what we want to develop here is that same kind of a ingrained focus here to, to say, let's do something from the data perspective because it has been ignored for so long. And the idea of going against your organization is not what you want to do. If they're moving in a direction, use the DIMBOK to complement what they're doing uh, out there. And I think you'll find it's, it's quite easy to do that because the DIMBOK, as I said, is not prescriptive. Matt, your, your services group gets into that business as well, does it not? Yes, we do. And um, we, it, we basically come up with a decision tree. And it's based on business impact and more importantly, the timing of the business impact will generally drive the governance decision. And so get back to what I said earlier, just be consistent to that and you'll be fine. The, the, where groups start to, where things start to get off the rails 
is when they start doing their own thing. That's where you start having people with their own Excel data stores, for example. And when you try to figure out why from maybe from an analytics perspective, two people aren't lining up or aren't agreeing on what the value is, that's usually your problem. Somebody is relying on content that has been managed outside of the framework. And that's what gets you into trouble. Super, super. Again, great question in there. And I appreciate the uh, into, in, in subtlety with which the question was asked, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So uh, can you, uh, either of you, give uh, examples of storytelling? Well, hopefully the things I gave at the end there were, were stories. I mean, I, I want you guys to be aware of the cryptocurrency story at this point and the, the, uh, the, the ideas around that. Matt, do you keep a, a focus on that or is that my we, own uh, imagination? That is no, no, off? completely we do because, and as data people, we get accused of this in the past and it's around nomenclature. We fire out words that other data experts know inherently and we lose half of our user group because they haven't figured out what the word means. And so we talk about one of the best stories we use is when you get a contractor in you don't really care that they're using this type of saw or that type of saw or this drill bit or that drill bit. You just want the closet remodeled. That's what you're after. So the storytelling is for us coming up with an analogy that everybody understands at a fourth grade level and getting away from some of the terminology we get rightfully accused of using that adds to the confusion rather than clears it up. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. The idea of first, of, you know, complex concepts like normalization are important mm -hmm. to understand and that they are addressed, but that's not what you want to talk about at the boardroom table. It'll get you tossed out of there in your ear real quickly. Again, yeah, great question. Thanks for it. Yeah. Differences and what the two roles are represent in an enterprise where data is broken down by domains. Can we associate the data domain manager with a data owner and a subject matter expert with a data steward? So Matt, this is like the third date for us here, right? So I'm going to go out on a limb and, and say, I don't like the idea of anybody owning anything around data. I like the data to be owned by the organization. And if somebody insists on owning some aspect of it, I would give them ownership of the requirements of the data while it is in that version of the CRUD matrix that their uh, uh, domain allows them to work with them. So that's a dodge on that question and mainly to provoke Matt there to see what he's got to say on it. It is a dodge, but it's not completely um, inaccurate, I would say. We, we define the data owner is the person who defines what good data looks like. So make it try to make it you know going back to the whole fourth grade level, what what data needs to look like to do what they need to do. What we don't really subscribe to, but this happens especially with like really cross functional data components. So I'll give you an example: the SAP Material Master. In some instances of that, you don't have you don't really have an owner, but you have a lot of people who care. And so to get to an owner, you want like this one throat to choke kind of a theory. And it's really tough to get to with the cr really cross-functional objects. That one, oh, from an ownership perspective, always gets a little tricky. And because in some organizations, engineering says, we'll take it. And some um, manufacturing will say, yeah, we want it. And other times it's supply chain. So the hard part, with those cross-functional objects is, is sometimes it may be easier on the organization for the, and I don't subscribe to this, but sometimes it's easier for the organization to get past it if the governance group actually handles the ownership and is required to go deal with all the shareholders appropriately. Mm -mm. You guys tell them, right? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> So uh, again, 
good good de- third date so far about this is great so uh yeah the I- the idea of ownership is really problematic and one of the tools that will help you all out with that is something that Matt's alluding to but it's just a racy chart showing mm-hmm. that there would be in fact one decision maker over that and having multiple decision makers is going to be problematic um but at the same time getting to that codification can be the challenge for people and I, I've just found in my own practice over the years that allowing any group inside to, quote, own just the data is, uh, you know, even for, for certain product uh, product or domain areas, is really the most problematic aspect of it because it incorporates the worst behavior, unfortunately. So you want things that complement the organization's uh, culture that will do this. And so absolutely, if somebody insists on owning something, show them that what they need to do is understand where the data comes from, what happens to it while it's under their care and where it goes from there. And that while it's under their care, they can absolutely own the requirements, which is a long, fancy way of saying exactly what Matt said. And uh, that, that with from that perspective, uh, you know, they they play a really key role because they're determining viability uh, for the organization. So that's usually enough right there. And they have enough responsibilities. They're like, yeah, OK, somebody else. I mean, think about it. who would own the data of accounting? Right, that's coming from everywhere else in the organization. So there, there are interesting roles uh, within all that. And as I said, it's a relatively new discipline. One of the things we can look towards, though, and this is something that most people don't consider from a data governance perspective, is that it's been the law since 2018 in the U.S. federal government to have what they're calling best data management practices, and everybody's interpreting correctly, I believe, as the DIMBOK in terms of the high-level guidance that I mentioned before. It's again not a prescriptive document. Um, that's where you're going to need some more specialized, uh, but they've been practicing this area and there for five years at this point and are achieving some very, very nice successes. So there are some uh, lots of parts of the federal government that are good enough to teach other parts of the federal government uh, how to do this. And, and that we are seeing, in fact, a, a very good microcosm. And no, not everybody is uh, the federal government, but gosh, uh, some of the practices are, are truly universal and you wouldn't want to be different just because the government does them that way. Uh, maybe that's another topic, Shannon, we dive into and do a, a federal government one. Ah, especially if we go back to DGIQ East uh, in uh, December. Sorry, I'm babbling now. Matt, would I add anything to that question? No, I, 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 I think you're fine. For sure. Back to you, Shannon. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> great. I love it. Um, and the call for presentations is open right now for DC if y'all want to get in on that. Um, so we I look sold out to last year. So yeah, don't, don't yeah. let it slip. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, so do you uh, think there's any management difference between text and numerical data? Mm-hmm. Or what we call tabular and non-tabular or what everybody else calls structured and unstructured, right, Matt? Yeah. Um, at its basic level, no. Every Every data component, and I use that word carefully, stands on its own merit. And it's what that data drives should drive the the governance decision, whether you're going to do something with it on ingestion, after the fact, or not do anything at all and let a group of experts deal with it. You know, there's certain example, there's certain financial components that because it's so centrally maintained that you can handle it via a work instruction, shall we say. But yeah, I don't believe from a a, a true governance perspective and how you were going. Now, some of the, I would say some of the tactics you use could differ between structured and unstructured, you know, what what tools in the toolbox you have to deal with it, but at a base level of how, how choosing to govern it, I don't believe there's any difference where there should be. Good governance principles apply across, and I find that to be also true. Matt. The real key that most of the unstructured is doing is that they're still trying to turn it into a binary event. And I think one of the questions to ask is, 
is that in fact appropriate? This is where quantum computing make it very interesting and things that are 20 years out from us at this point that uh, probably bore everybody to tears if we started talking about that map. But the, the idea, of course, of you know looking through a videotape and trying to identify a break into a truck, uh, which is one of the, the projects I've worked on before. Uh, the whole goal for that, for looking through that, was to try and determine was the truck being broken into or not. And uh, I know that's not very interesting, but it turns out to be a really challenging AI type uh, activity in there. And so working with that data was you benefiting from the decision tree that Matt was talking about before. And it was, you know, it was, uh, gosh, let me give a, the, the measure of break-inness was a, a confidence measure rather than a, an absolute measure. So it wasn't binary uh, around that, but it still ended up being, you know, if five of the 10 conditions are met, we throw the switch and, uh, you know, call the guard over to double check on what's going on in this particular sector. Um, so it, it gets there, yes. Uh, it's it's a matter of tempering expectations. It's a matter of, I, I would add one thing too, Matt, and again, I'll let you jump in here, but mm -hmm. what we see so often in the AI community is a determination that they can, in fact, tell everything that's going on. And one of my favorite examples is a, uh, a Tesla encountering a horse and buggy for the first time. If you just mm. Google that, you'll be able to find the video out there. What should be happening there is that, that that unstructured data that's coming through at that point in time, and again, wrong term, it's non-tabular data, but coming through there, the AI should have said, I don't know what that thing is. And having the category of other, as opposed to it must be a semi-truck or it must be a person or it must be, you know, again, different things, it really is a crippling, architecturally deficient component of what goes on. And this is where data governance must get involved and, and apply these ethical frameworks in the same way as we were talking about the data governance frameworks here. That's more of an operational uh, plea uh, that has to do with that, but uh, certainly a component. Anyway, jump jump in, Matt. I'm, no, I think it's yeah. funny. I think we answered this question in, in the chat about AI and machine learning. And I think there is a, a place for it in data governance and we we've seen and we've actually developed started to develop prototypes to do critical data element identification or at least propose these elements seem to be really driving what you're doing from in a, a lot of the first prototypes from an analytic perspective but in some cases we've had to like my groups had to get involved to say this is what you're looking for and why. And I don't think that can ever be conjured up by AI. Someone's still gonna have to point AI in the right place and tell them what it's looking for. It might be worthwhile, for example, to use AI to help do that investigation to determine mm -hmm. what are your, but it's not quite exactly as you said, it's, it's going to be the same thing where it discovers that wolves are are things that look like dogs that have snow in the background. And that's the only criteria that it understands, yes. uh, which is, of course, we know is incorrect in terms of differentiating wolves and dogs uh, that are there. Yeah, I do want to double back in that. And again, we could probably do a whole webinar on just your identification of the critical data elements there. But I, I want to emphasize what Matt said there is that not all of your data elements, I mean, SAP starts off with 20,000 tables and 200,000 data elements. You better believe that that same number of refining and, and getting to the, the critical things occurs in there. And that in many SAP systems, it's the same number of couple hundred critical data elements that are what you need to control and govern. And even if you say, if management pushes back on it and says, no, you've got to govern everything, right? Because I've seen that happen. It's sort mm -hmm. of silly, but it, it does happen. Just say, good, these are phase one. And, and when we're done with phase one, we'll we'll start working on phase two and three and four, you know, and, and get to it. But it, if you want to make a difference with your governance initiatives, and I'm sorry, you know, we're going to have a, 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 a recession of some sort here. It's just the nature of the business cycle. I'm not imminently predicting anything. It's just knowing that the longer we go without it, the more likely one is to occur in there. And these are the initiatives that are going to get cut. On the other hand, if they look at your data governance efforts and say, yeah, I, I gave them a uh, you know, million dollars last year to invest in, in things, and they clearly delivered $10 million worth of value from it, you're not going to get cut uh, when that happens uh, coming up, uh, that you'll be able to have that sustainable uh, effort in there. So the, focusing in on those are your best opportunity to really achieve leverage uh, within the organization. 
Again, Matt, just jump it over to you if you would add in on that, but I, I just think that's a really key piece of your, your method there. Yeah, it's, it, it's all about delivering a business outcome. It's, 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 I can't say it any more simply than that. Governance for governance sake, who cares? It, great. Um, in, I think the, the rules start to get a little different from a governance perspective when you start getting into like self-service analytics or groups that want to get into selling their own data product because now you, you really have to certify a complete data set instead of saying the, out of this data set, these 10 elements are critical. You're gonna have to go certify it all. That's the only chance, time when someone brings up, they think, well, we gotta govern everything. If that's what you're, if what you're doing is self-service analytics or selling that data, yes, now you've got to go govern everything because it all, you don't know what, a consumer of that is going to use and why. So that that's where it becomes a little different. But most of the time, you stick to the CDEs first. The other thing that you can do when you're faced with that self-service criteria is to say that we're going to have two branded types of data in our organization. And one is the one is data that is of, of known quality. And one is of data that is of unknown quality. And probably you shouldn't mix the two um, if you're getting ready for a board level presentation on uh, you know, future trends of the organization, just to give a, a precise example on that. Back over yeah. to you, Shannon. We should we probably kick this one to death, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It's it's a great uh, conversation and great topic. Great question. So, you know, um, but moving on here, we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, any advice of a business glossary that helps to simplify our language? We always go start, first. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, we always start with the role names first, just so everybody's starting to use, keep calling people I don't care really about accuracy, more consistently throughout the organization so everybody know who's doing what. Um, and one of the bigger uh, hurdles we've always had is some groups use the term or the role name data steward for somebody who's gonna be putting in material master records all day. And that's not the, it, it, we don't believe that's the case. We believe the data steward is a governance professional who ensures that the processes are being adhered to consistently and ensures that data is being, is fit for purpose. That, those, that first hurdle starts to get everybody in line around how we're gonna to talk to each other, who's doing what. When, after that, the, the glossary helps, I believe, in like a very disparate landscape where group, not groups that, I just read the chat question, sorry, um, where different, the same element is called very different things and creating that connection between the two helps groups figure out where things are coming from, especially from a lineage perspective. So Matt, I'll jump in then and, and say, first of all, to everybody listening here again, thanks for these great questions. Matt interpreted the question that was asked as where in our vast array of start potential starting places should we start? And his answer was focused on the roles. I interpreted the question differently, Matt, and I interpreted it as what products should one purchase in order to get the capabilities in there? Um, so uh, I'll answer it from that perspective. Oh, that's and just say, right, no, no answers are wrong, right? No, 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 not, no, not wrong at all. I never even thought of it that way. 
So, so my guidance here is don't uh, buy a product because then you have to ask permission. But instead, you can do something that I call the Nokia term bank. Uh, I worked for Nokia for four years and watched them go through a very interesting transition of, of literally transforming their business from purely a European company into a worldwide company that all spoke English and that English was spoken at all meetings. And they created a literal a, a, um, a term bank that if the group was sitting around and had a conversation and didn't understand a term, they would look around and ask, what does this term mean? And if they didn't know, they would consult the glossary. And if the glossary didn't have it in it, they would add a submission to, to fill in the glossary. But the glossary was simply based on reading a web page. So once a week, they would reformat a web page that was searchable with a browser. So we're talking zero technology here that could allow the organization to start defining, as, as Matt said, the goals, if that's the starting point that you want to have. And there's a good sense for doing roles because as, absolutely it's something that everybody understands to a large degree and also helps to build on the existing culture. Uh, so don't buy products is, is my guidance uh, for starters. Instead, build your own, work with the components of having a unified glossary, a controlled vocabulary for a bit, and then you'll have a whole lot better conversation when you are ready to talk to the vendors uh, about specifics on that. So two answers for the price of one there on that. Yeah, rules before tools, people. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right, so how important is RACI in data governance and can it be modified based on organizational structure? Wow, so- um, Go ahead, you go first I, this time. Yeah, I, I, I make sure I understand the question correctly. I don't believe that the concept of RACI uh, is, is something that you necessarily would be able to improve on or somebody would have done so. Uh, in the in in the you know subsequent years, it's such a basic useful tool. But does do, are you using RACI and the whole chart as itself as a a way of evolving your understanding of how the organization should govern its data? Absolutely, uh, and a RACI tool is a very good way of doing that from a structured perspective. Uh, so, Matt, how did you hear that question? Because it might be completely different. <laughs> no, I heard it pretty much the same way. And it, right. there's two things we when we work with a group that's starting down the governance journey. And for, the, for us, those, those groups are the most fun. Two things we, we get them to do pretty much right off the jump is create a charter and do a racy. And it, and it can evolve over time and that's completely fine, but the charter especially, and the groups that have been successful getting their program off the ground have, have done the charter and have gotten buy-in and are able to make progress in their, in what they're tasked with doing is because new group, when a new governance group gets put into an organization, sometimes they become the dumping ground for work that other groups don't have the skill sets to do and don't want to do. And those tasks, people trying to be good corporate citizens, but those tasks sometimes can take them away from what their real purpose is supposed to be. And so the charter kind of protects them. The RACI ensures we're not overburdening the same groups of people, because that also happens for every individual initiative that comes up. So I, I personally believe they're both critical. Yeah, great question. It's a, if we didn't hit it right, reach out to us individually. We're not hard to find. I'm happy mm -hmm. to follow up with you on that. Do we have time for one more, Shannon, or are we? We've got three minutes left, so I'm going to All slip right. in as many as I can here. Uh, with so many great questions coming in. So from a capability standpoint, do you think data governance can take some cues from Six Sigma, given the higher the high context of data in Six Sigma? Once again, the discipline around that is admirable. I was, uh, again, not that you want to resolve on one data point, but I was uh, introduced to um, uh, the, the, the quality movements in the Department of Defense, which was rightfully trying to adopt the Protestants, but was not really capable, at least at the unit that I was at, uh, of uh, implementing a disciplined Six Sigma piece. So I'd say 
ish and directionally and and perhaps maybe a realistic version of it but that's a, a short answer matt i'll turn it over to you the one thing and i i read this question when it came up and it triggered something the one thing that you can take from six sigma is the continuous improvement mm -hmm. and we talk about it as how governance groups once you fix an error meaning you've remediated the data you've done your data cleansing the continuous improvement is putting something in place from a governor perspective whether that's a data quality report or a data validation check inside a system that's the part for me of six sigma that coincides very well with the governance program because you're continue once you do that you're continually improving the program and the organization's data. So I do think there's some parallels there. Super. Ben, on, one more. Mm -hmm. See, can they do it? Well, we've got about 30 seconds left, unfortunately. So I don't think we're going to be able to get another question in, but <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say thank you so much for all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. It was, again, it was so nice to meet so many people in person last week. Uh, always love that uh, networking capabilities. And Peter and Matthews, thank you so much for this great presentations. For, thank you to Precisely for sponsoring and helping to make today's webinar happen. Um, really appreciate uh, you joining us in the conversation, Matt. It's been Absolutely, a pleasure. Absolutely, my pleasure. And I hope you can all join us next week or next month on the second Tuesday of the month for next, Peter's next webinar. Uh, again, I'll send a follow-up email with links to the slides, links to the recording, and the additional information requested throughout. So by end of day Thursday. So thanks, y'all. Hope you have a great day. Yeah, yeah. Great discussion. Thanks so much for participating. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Shannon. Bye, everybody.